So welcome everyone on the on the last day. Congratulations on making it to the last day of QPL. Many of us have fallen. Um, and also thanks to the organizers and the, and the program committee for putting together this great program. Uh, I will talk about this work that we did. Uh, well, I have my hands now, right? I'm going to swap hands. That we did with uh, Micheletta is a PhD student in the same group where I am with Tony Asin and uh, Janek and Karla from, from the University of Warsaw. And uh, I will talk about Bernon locality and device independent quantum key and the relation of these two concepts. And I will, there's not much time, so I will just briefly introduce you to the, to the concepts. First, Bernon locality. I just have one slide on this, but hopefully other people had more slides on it earlier today. So we're in a setup where there are two parties, Alice and Bob, and they sort of perform some actions. They have some, usually we think about these as measurements, but some kind of choices for Alice to label it with X. And uh, they perform some sort of physical action. They, they end up with a classical output that we call A for Alice. And similarly for Bob, we have Y and B. And uh, we don't really assume anything about the inner workings of these boxes. Like you just push some buttons labeled with, with the X's and you obtain some outcomes. And uh, crucially, Alice and Bob cannot communicate during this experiment, but they might share some sort of correlations, classical or quantum in, in like reasonable theories, let's say. Um, so what we're interested in is the probabilities of, of, of obtaining these outcomes A and B, given the settings X and Y. And uh, if, you, if you believe in quantum theory, then all you can achieve in this is Correlations that you can write in this form, sharing some some row on a, on this tensor product Hilbert space, some state, and then um, this should come from some some kind of measurement. So these are like the POVM elements, the A's, the A's and the B's. All you can achieve uh, in this form forms the quantum set, which is a convex set in in some sort of real Euclidean space. Now the other kind of reasonable theory, let's say, is that is classical, which we which is usually referred to as the local set. So any correlation that you can write as basically a convex combination of um, product probabilities, right? So Alice's outcome only depends on her input and some kind of shared variable lambda. And Bob's outcome only depends on his input and the same shared variable lambda. You can sort of integrate over this, over this lambda. So eventually, the eventual correlation doesn't depend on lambda, right? It's just some sort of, this is what's called a local hidden variable model, right? It's hidden because you average over it. It's local because if you condition on it, then Alice and Bob sort of separate. And okay, so this is kind of the, the generic form, but it's equivalent to a form like this, where you just sum up over some discrete values of lambda. And uh, these, are the, these are deterministic correlations, right? So given X and lambda, Alice's output is fixed and the same for Bob. These are like the deterministic correlations. And these are actually the extremal points of the of this set, the local set. So this is a polytope. The extremal points are deterministic. And you get this kind of nice picture that everyone always draws. So this is kind of the how you should more or less imagine these sets. There's a polytope, the local set, and there's the quantum set, which is strictly bigger. This is sort of Bell's theorem, which I will not have time to explain, but hopefully more, most of you know. So this is my only slide on Bannon locality. Now we're moving on to device independent quantum key distribution, which might be like sort of a bit less known for everybody. So I will spend a bit more time on this. I will just start with key distribution. This is sort of the main task, like what, what we want to achieve. Again, we have Alice and Bob. So, you know, so far so good. You see some sort of connection and they want to end up with some key. So these are, you can think of them as like strings of bits. Alice has a string of bits and Bob has one. And what they want these bit, these strings to do, they want them to be the same. And they want them to be random. And you might ask random for whom and pretty much everyone else, right? So you want these bit strings uh, for Alice and Bob to share this and nobody else can like predict what these bits are. So this is like the sort of main task of key distribution. How do you do it quantumly? Well, one way you can imagine is that if they share a, this is a singlet state, let's say they share a singlet state and they make measurements in the computational basis locally. Now with, with one half probability, Alice will get zero, Bob will get one and the other way around. So, okay, now they are kind of anti-correlated, but then Bob can always just sort of flip his bit if he wants to. 
So basically, with this protocol, they end up with completely random bits, and nobody else can predict this, right? Because it comes from this pure quantum state with like equal probability of collapsing onto zero or one. So this really gives you this uh, this secret key. The problem with this is that it's not device independent. So how do we make it device independent? Now we don't trust anything. We don't trust like what these devices do. So you know, if you go back here, we had to know what the state is. We had to know what the measurements are. Now we don't want to have this assumption because in the cryptographic scenario, this is kind of we are paranoid. You know, maybe the maybe some eavesdropper is controlling the source. Maybe someone else was manufacturing the devices. So you don't want to a priori assume what your state is and what your measurements are. You you want to just end up with a with a proof that you do have a secret key only based on these the correlations that most of you can't see, but it's the same stuff as you had before. So this is the kind of idea of uh, DIQKD. And how do we do this? Well, the kind of standard way, that's the most known way, is based on the, the CHSAG inequality, which again, I don't have time to put on the slides, but hopefully like many of you know this, but even if you don't, it's um, it's not that important. So you just, you, we're going back to a bell scenario with uh, two inputs for each, no, two outputs for each party, two inputs for Alice, three inputs for Bob. So it's like a, a slight um, twist on the usual CHSH scenario. And we use the, the zero one inputs to basically certify the states and the measurements. So maybe you know, like if you play the CHSH game, if you if you get the maximal violation of the of the CHSH inequality, then this essentially certifies your setup. So you can then say that yes, indeed, my state is let's say the singlet state or some maximally entangled state, and the first measurement of Alice is just the computational basis measurement. Okay, so this these first two inputs certify the setup, and then. If you want a perfect key, this is why we have the third out, third input for Bob. So this we just choose to be sort of again the computational basis, which is not present in the original CHSH inequality. But then these input pair, the input pair uh, zero for Alice and two for Bob, we are back in this previous scenario and we know exactly what the state is. We know exactly, well, almost exactly what the, the measurements are, and uh, we get this perfect key. So this is how we do. Um, the IQKD um, in practice, maybe I can say that because now <laughs> there are some experiments. So this is how they do it, basically. Right. So let's get a bit more general. I will describe to you like what is a what we call a standard DIQKD protocol. So it again starts with some kind of bell scenario. Alice and Bob are measuring. They are collecting their outputs, and well, they are collecting these kind of strings of bits or dits or whatever their outputs. There are n, let's say, n measurement rounds, but we will be interested in the in the case when this n goes to infinity, so like asymptotic key rates. Yes, yeah, so they do this. Well, now they have their output. Now they want to to know what is the correlation that they share. Well, for this, first they must kind of communicate to each other and tell each other at least part of their data, like what settings they chose, what outcome they got, because you know at this point here, they only see like their local outcomes so in order in order to estimate the, the joint distribution they need to like communicate a bit and this these they will throw away at the end so okay they just kind of reveal some part of their data they throw it away but now they have like some pretty good estimate on what the probabilities are if you really believe in this like asymptotic limit then well you can you can estimate these these correlations up to arbitrary precision so you do this and then this is the the standard part in in the title and in uh, in this in this standard QKD protocols, because like the previous the CHSH protocol and like most of the ones that are known to be secure, they have this step in which Alice and Bob they both communicate just the settings of the remaining uh, measurement rounds. They don't tell the the outcomes, right? Because well, this communication is public, right? So in principle, anyone can kind of listen in. So you you have to be careful what you do in this communication. But in the in the standard protocols, there is this step when they tell each other which which settings they chose. If you think about the CHSH protocol, they need to know when they have the when they chosen the measurements that are aligned. So so there is this step, and after this, they are still allowed to communicate classic publicly. So they this can be arbitrary. 
they're like arbitrarily many messages exchanged and based on these messages and based on their outputs and all the information they kind of have they try to establish the key the key string and uh, what we're interested in is the key rate which i called r here so there's like some kind of okay you can formally define it it's basically like a, a regularized uh, mutual information of these these random variables alice's key and bob's key this first one just says that well they should be the same basically and the second one says that the mutual information of the key with so this e is the eavesdropper which i haven't told you about yet but i will put put her in the picture in the next slide so the eavesdroppers mutual information together with all these public messages that were exchanged um, with the key should be very small, right? This basically tells you that the eavesdropper should not know anything about the key, pretty much. So this is like, you can formally define the key rate in this sense. This is just like how many bits of secret key you get per measurement round, roughly speaking. This is what we're interested in. And now I put the eavesdropper in the picture. So everything that's kind of orangey is the eavesdropper. So we, what, we, what we will imagine now is that the eavesdropper is distributing the state. Um, so Alice and Bob don't know what the state is, so the, it might be controlled by an eavesdropper. And the eavesdropper was also like manufacturing the devices. So she knows what the measurements are. She might not know what the measurement choices are. Well, in the standard protocol, she will learn at some point. But, you know, it's just kind of pre-manufacturing it, giving it to Alice and Bob, and then kind of working with this knowledge. So what Alice and Bob see is just kind of the, the average state that's being sent in each individual round, but the eavesdropper knows in each round which state was being sent. <clears throat> and based on all this kind of information, you know, she knows the state, she knows what measurements are in the boxes. And also in the standard protocol, she will learn which settings were chosen. For each measurement round, she will kind of make a guess of, okay, what is the outcome of Alice and Bob, right? And at this point, this is very general. You can imagine like any kind of strategies, what states she chooses, what measurements are in the boxes, and how to kind of combine these to a guess on the outputs. I will give you a specific example for this. But uh, in general, you end up with kind of a tripartite classical correlation. Mm, Alice and Bob's outcome given X and Y, this is just the same like in the Bell scenario. Now there's also Eve, who has this kind of guess on what should be Alice's and Bob's outcome. So you have this tripartite correlation. And after this, um, so we're still only at, at this point in time. And after this, Alice and Bob still kind of exchange some classical messages trying to extract the secret key from this correlation. So <clears throat> from this point, it's basically like a classical problem. What is the key that Alice and Bob can, can extract from this tripartite correlation against the eavesdropper? So what we're interested in mostly is, is deriving upper bounds on this key rate that I introduced to you. So again, same, same kind of picture. The first part is, well, it's just quantum, right? Alice and Bob are measuring the state, obtaining the outcomes and seeing like what is the correlation. And in general, we're interested in like in, in which correlations are useful for, for the IQKD. Then there's a second part, which we call standard the IQKD, where there is this round where the, where the inputs are announced. And after this, we end up with this classical uh, tripartite correlation. <clears throat> so once we have that, we can use results from classical cryptography, which are kind of well known in some communities. Right? And there is a result that we, are, that we will use specifically is that from a given classical tripartite correlation, you can upper bound the key rate using this quantity, which is called the intrinsic information. This is something that you can essentially just compute from this correlation. It's like it's basically like a conditional mutual information optimized over local stochastic maps on Eve, if you know what these mean. If not, then don't, it's, it's not a problem, right? It's just something that you can basically compute from here. Right, so this is how we, how we want to derive upper bound on the key rate given, given the correlation. And just before I go to the results, I tell you why Bell non-locality is necessary for, <clears throat> for device-independent quantum key distribution. If you imagine that the correlation that Alice and Bob see is local, you can write it in this convex combination of deterministic correlations, right? And then, well, especially if, if, if even like the, 
the inputs are announced, you can give this hidden variable to, to the eavesdropper, the lambda, and conditioned on this lambda, the eavesdropper knows everything, basically. In every round, she knows what is the outcome of Alice and Bob, and there's no chance of extracting a key. So it's necessary for the IQKD to, to, obtain, to observe correlations that are not local. And we're asking a question whether it's also sufficient. And what we find is that it's not for a large class of, of uh, correlations for these standard protocols. And the way we do it is by designing a specific eavesdropping attack, which is actually quite simple, so I can even tell you what it looks like. We call it the convex combination attack. So let's assume that the correlation that Ellis and Bob observe is something, some non-local correlation, let's say. I can always write it as a convex combination of something local in the red part and something non-local with some weight QL and 1 minus QL. I can always write it like this, right? So now I imagine that what happens is actually the eavesdropper is distributing a local state and a non-local state with like these two probabilities. Um, and we saw before that in the local rounds, basically the eavesdropper knows everything. So I can construct this tripartite correlation, the classical one, which is again like the same convex combination, but in the local rounds, Eve knows exactly what is the output of Alice and Bob. So I have this kind of Kronecker delta, like Eve's output is always the same as the pair of Alice and Bob's output. And in the non-local rounds, well, maybe she doesn't know anything. This is what we assume. Maybe she does know something, but we don't care about that. So I wrote down the tripartite correlation. Basically, for any, like for any correlation that I start with, some quantum correlation, I can write this down. If I find like a convex decomposition, then I write down the tripartite one. And what you want, if you want to kind of find the strongest attack, is to, well, reasonably what you would want to do is maximize this local weight, this QL. And uh, so if you start from a, an arbitrary correlation, maybe you find a non-local correlation that you want to, to use in this convex decomposition. But once that's fixed, finding the maximal QL is just a linear program. So this is kind of efficient to compute I give you a non-look, I give you any kind of quantum correlation. Okay, you kind of need to make a guess here what you want to use, but once you do that, it's really simple to compute this, this whole thing. <clears throat> so yes, you can you can find this tripartite correlation, and then you can you can just compute the, the upper bound of the key rate using this intrinsic information. <clears throat> so this is this is the attack that we use, and we use it on protocols that that can be written as measuring a Werner state with projective measurements. So now we're looking at uh, correlations, a class of correlations that you can write in this form. You have the Werner state, where right? it's the singlet with visibility V mixed with 1 minus V times like the completely mixed state. And these measurements are projective. But we don't put a, a bound on the number of these measurements. So this could be even infinitely many if you want. And importantly, we don't assume that this is actually the state that they use and the measurements are projective. We just assume that you can write the correlation in this form. And the reason we use this is because yesterday we already had a slide on, on, on exactly this plot, so that's good. So for, the, for this Werner state, it's known that this visibility parameter, if it's less than this V local, like 0.68, then any correlation coming from this state with any number of projective measurements must be local. So there is this kind of bound on the local visibility. And then there is also a bound on where it can already be non-local, this 0.696. So for this visibility, you can find some measurements which give you non-local correlations. And OK, this gap, you know, the real value is somewhere in between. We don't know, but these are kind of close enough such that we can we can make some, some claims using this. So we look at protocols like this, and we apply this convex combination attack. And the way we apply it is via, you remember that we had these kind of two states that one gives the local correlation, the other one gives a non-local correlation. For the local one, we can just choose the Werner state with this local visibility that I, that I just had here, for which we know that all correlations are local. And for the non-local state, we just use the singlet state, like perfect singlet state. And uh, if we write it like this, um, we can actually compute this, this local weight analytically. You don't even need to use the, the linear program. And you can compute the key rate. You can even <clears throat> then optimize over the measurements, like what is the best measurement that Alison Bob could put in this protocol 
to get the maximum key rate. And then you will find that there is a region of, of visibility uh, where you will not get a key. And this region, it contains all the local, but also some of the non-local points. So in this kind of little region between the, the lower bound on the non-local visibility of the Werner state and this critical visibility that we find, there are correlations that are non-local, but you cannot use the, <clears throat> the standard DIQKD protocols to extract the key. And this is a lot of correlations, right? Like, you just need to be able to write your correlations as measuring a Werner state with the visibility in this region and with any kind of projective measurements. And this gives you a lot. And these are all <clears throat> sort of useless for these protocols. So what are the what are the implications and the limitations of this result? So you can you can kind of put this in the in the standard CHSH protocol. And okay, there we know the, the local visibility perfectly. So the, on this plot, you have the visibility in a CHSH type protocol. Here you have perfect visibility, one bit of key. Here you have the, the local bound, no key. And then, okay, these like dashed lines, these are upper bounds from some uh, previous works. The shaded region is the lower bound from the original paper on this, on this protocol. And this, uh, this solid green line is the, is the upper bound that you get from our attack. And it goes to zero at this, at this critical visibility before the correlation becomes local. So you use the standard CHSH protocol. Um, if your visibility is here, your correlation is still non-local. You still violate the CHSH inequality, but you will not get a key. And you can kind of generalize this using like this uh, bias CHSH inequalities. So you don't just get like this, uh, this line of useless correlations, but you can also have like uh, these two dimensional regions. So this is not like a, a small peculiarity of this line, but you can really get like some volumes, well, volumes, <laughs> but you can get some regions. Um, and then the limitations is, okay, we assume this standard protocols, right? So the question is what happens if only one party announces the, the inputs and there exist protocols like this, that like you can use the CHSH game with no additional settings and just one party announcing the, uh, the setting. For these protocols, so far, we couldn't really find such generic uh, no-go results. There are some results in this direction, but, but it might be the case that these kind of protocols are, are better if you have a, a large noise. So, yeah, this is all I wanted to say. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Thanks a lot to, uh, to Mate. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you could give a bit of an intuition where you think this separation really comes from and perhaps also thinking um, because you are, I mean, you, you said perhaps you're using like a large system, I mean, like a Werner state that is uh, kind of, I mean, where, or, or do you use copies of Werner states? Like, I mean, yeah. Werner states are depolarized states, right? You, you could have technically have a mixture of a maximally entangled state and a completely mixed state. I mean, so is it like over all these kind of bigger systems, the maximally entangled state mixed with them? A completely mixed state, or is it kind of a copy of Werner states on uh, on bipartite states? So it's a, it's a single system, right? You so for so for these results, what we have is yeah, you use this Werner state, which is exactly what you said, like a maximally maximally entangled state mixed with a maximally mixed state. Yeah. Okay. But so in this case, you have okay. So let's say assume uh, you have like a qubit, then. Uh, a and B have are two output have two outputs yes. each or three uh, depend yeah. but um, so it, now you generalize it to uh, like whatever uh, an infinite amount of out output and how does this how does your your state tra transform? So for for more outputs we don't we don't really know right so in this we we heavily use this result that that these measurements okay these measurements are basically projective. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, because you're on a qubit, you have two outputs. If you have more outputs, like 
this this local visibility result it doesn't hold for for POVMs. You have a much lower visibility, critical visibility there. So we only have results for two outcomes at this point. You might be able to do something similar in like uh, scenarios in more outputs. We didn't really look at this, and I'm not sure. But if you, I think you can potentially get like specific results. You have like a specific um, DXUKD protocol which uses like QDIT and uses some like D outcome measurement, and and perhaps in this Bell scenario, you know exactly like where at what visibility. If you if you use the kind of same mixture with the with the maximum mixed state, at what visibility you would go to local, you could still use the same kind of convex combination attack on that. And well, okay, I don't, <clears throat> I don't know, but I assume that you potentially could get similar results, but we haven't looked at that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get an intuition like uh, where this where the separation really comes from. I mean, it seems very interesting, but uh, like, would you say it's, it's really part of your uh, assumption or like do you, does it occur in when you bow when you use these bounds on on um, the, these entropic values or I mean where where mm. do you see this uh, separation so it's not well, it's not exactly clear that Bernon locality should correspond to to positive key rates right there's an intuition that maybe it can because okay you always have some randomness right basically this but then for the UKD, you need a bit more. You need randomness, but you also need correlations. And like, okay, whether this must disappear exactly at the local set, to me, okay, this is not exactly clear, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I don't have an intuition for either direction, like a strong enough that I would be happy to like <laughs> publicly say, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, um, does anyone else have perhaps a last question? Uh, thanks for the talk. I have quite an ignorant question. Um, how significant is the assumption of n going to infinity here? Like, can you do this away from the asymptotic limit? So, I believe that it will only make the key rate worse. So, in this sense, it's not really important, right? If you if you have finite statistics, okay, there are some methods of like uh, trying to bound the key rate in that sense, but then you you as Alice and Bob have some sort of ignorance on the on the actual probability distribution and all of this in a sense you kind of have to give to the eavesdropper so you're only making the eavesdropper stronger if you don't have this asymptotic limit so this in a sense this basically holds also in finite you, you will only get worse in the so the methodology is, is exactly the same if you go away from the asymptotic so the limit. if you really want to like compute precise upper bounds, I think you probably have to deal with all these corrections, but I would say that at least intuitively, like you could still say that, well, this holds also at any finite rate. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, all right. So I think in the interest of keeping on time with the session, perhaps we'll wrap up the questions there and you can, um, can ask Mate afterwards if you have further things. Um, so we'll thank Mate for a very interesting talk. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, thank you very much to the organizers for giving the opportunity to present this work and also organizing this workshop uh, conference, which I'm uh, enjoying a lot. Um, so I'm going to tell you a joint work uh, with my postdocs, as is Kari van Um So this is a new framework for quantum contextuality uh, that um, generalizes uh, the earlier approaches, sheaf theoretic and topological. So uh, I'm going to be explaining it in a very particular case, which is going to be the CHS state scenario, but it is very uh, much more general. I'll try to be emphasizing its generality at the end. Uh, so the idea is to represent uh, measurement statistics in a topological way, but of course here topology might mean different things for everyone. So I'll be uh, more precise in wh what that means. Uh, so the example I'm going to be considering is this one, uh, where uh, there are two parties, Alice and Bob, so you have seen this picture, maybe not hand-drawn, but many times. Uh, so the table here is the probability table, and you see uh, one of the PR boxes. Uh, so this is an example of a non-singling uh, distribution. So you can see that uh, condition uh, by looking at any of the rows or the columns uh, within each box, the sums are 
sums of the probabilities are the same. So this is the uh, non-signaling condition. And uh, so the idea is to uh, extend the uh, theory of non-signaling uh, distributions to something more general. Uh, so to do that, uh, first let me tell you a bit, just in one slide, what the shift theory does. So shift theory takes that property table and breaks it into, just describes it as a shift uh, where the basic um, feature property of a sheaf is the idea of restriction. So you see the marginals as restrictions from the larger uh, sets of distributions to the smaller ones to a single measurement. And then the non-signaling uh, condition is the matching of these marginalizations as indicated by the arrows. So this is a framework uh, due to Abramsky and Brandenburger. And uh, so this is um, just a, in one slide. Uh, of course, you can talk about much more uh, general uh, scenarios, but just particular uh, particularly that one uh, goes as, as that. Uh, and the other approach, which I mentioned is a topological one, which is due to myself, uh, Sam Roberts, uh, Stephen Bart, and um, Robert Rosendorf. Uh, in here, uh, if you start from the uh, CHS8 scenario again and assume that the part parties do a quantum measurement, say the Pauli measurement X and Z each, uh, you can extend the uh, context by multiplying the observables to you know, just extend the rows and columns to get the Perl's Merman square. And in this case, these observables, you have six contexts there and nine observables, they're going to satisfy certain algebraic relations. And topological approach turn this context, a uh, set of contexts into a set of triangles. And then at the end, if you glue them properly, you get a space, which turns out to be a torus. And the algebraic conditions, they, they, they are encoded as a cohomology class. And the cohomology class non-trivial means that you have state-independent contextuality. So it's again, one slide uh, for a topological uh, approach. So now uh, these two things are actually converting tables, or in this case, you don't see the tables, but they're actually implicit there if you choose a quantum state. So what the simplicial uh, distribution approach does kind of combines the two and then goes beyond. So let's take the simplest table you can have, like single measurements per parties, and reorganize those distributions for this, uh, four numbers in the triangle as follows. Uh, so they're organized in such a way that if you sum the uh, circled ones, so you get the correct marginals on the single measurements for X measurement for Y measurement. And the third edge here is uh, labeled uh, as, this is a particular choice, labeled uh, as the XOR of the measurements. Uh, there are different motivations for choosing that XOR. Uh, well, for this talk, it will be the CHSH inequalities because they're defined from the XORs, they are extracted from the XORs. Uh, so this is the, essentially the basic picture uh, for a particular uh, simplicial distribution, uh, which is just a triangle. You have, uh, you're just encoding that this box as a triangle. So then, uh, well, going to the triangle allows you to glue things. So that's the similar idea. So you can actually glue things to um, construct the CHS8 scenario. I just did something similar to the Merman case. Um, the two uh, contexts are omitted here in the middle. So if you glue this, uh, uh, glue the uh, top edge and the bottom edge and the left and right, you get a torus where a disc is removed. So it's called a punctured torus. Now, uh, if you go through the definition of simplicial distribution, which I'm not going to be giving, I'm just going to be just telling what it is uh, at the end, uh, it just turns out to be the same as non-signaling distributions on the CHS8 scenario. So I'll be actually talk about the same thing. Uh, just organized on a two-dimensional uh, space. So these are distributions on spaces. That's uh, what I mean by uh, simplicial distributions. So if you compare it to the sheep theoretic uh, description, there's a canonical way of uh, obtaining a space, which is a simplicial complex on the left hand side from the sheep theoretic description. Uh, there's a difference though. So in the sheep theoretic description, the measurements actually label the vertices if you do the uh, canonical realization. At the end, for the CHSA scenario, you get a one-dimensional object, just a circle or the boundary of a, uh, a square. Uh, I would like to emphasize that there's a dimensional shift here uh, in this particular uh, realization. Uh, there's another realization that I'm going to talk about, which is also two-dimensional for the CHSA scenario uh, when I uh, talk about the fines, uh, fines theorem. So there are different ways of realizing um, the usual stuff as as simplicial distributions, but there will be there are different benefits to that. So you can also talk about contextuality in this generalized uh, framework for simplicial distributions. 
the idea is, uh, you know, as usual, writing a distribution, which is on the left, a simplicial distribution as a probabilistic mixture of uh, deterministic uh, distribution. By a deterministic distribution, what I mean is you just assign uh, outcomes to uh, the measurements. So there are four measurements and you have four outcomes for them. Uh, this, of course, this is just a picture, but there's a, there's a framework behind that, uh, which uses uh, the theory of simplicial sets uh, from algebraic topology, which makes this equation precise. Uh, so essentially you can talk about uh, contextuality. Uh, you might ask, well, just a single triangle, uh, is it contextual or not? But of course it's non-contextual, this is a very simple example. And how do you see it in this framework? Well, you just have probabilities uh, as coefficients of the deterministic uh, uh, assignments or deterministic distribution. So this is non-contextual, but uh, there, there's also a very simple example, which doesn't actually occur uh, in shift theory or elsewhere, um, a contextual scenario, which is obtained by from the triangle by gluing the two edges which actually imposes uh, the, the condition on the uh, distribution saying that one, one is equal to one, zero, the probability for those outcomes. Uh, so if you look at this distribution uh, on the left, uh, it cannot be written as a probabilistic mixture of the deterministic ones. Uh, so that's a very simple, so it's actually something uh, new that appears in this formalism, although very simple, but you can think of much different, many different examples that uh, doesn't come as standard uh, non-signaling distribution. So it's an extension of the theory in that sense. So there's this famous theorem due to Fine uh, from 82, which says that uh, a distribution on the CHSA scenario is non-contextual if and only be satisfied the CHSA inequality is very uh, uh, textbook stuff. So if you have looked at the proof from 82 paper, uh, Fine defines a very clever uh, extension of the distribution and then studies that extension uh, and then, well, shows the direction that CHSH and uh, implies non-contextuality. That's the hard part. Uh, so if you regard uh, the distribution as a simplicial distribution, you can give a pictorial a proof of what it does and then break the proof into conceptual parts. So here, uh, the, the square over there is another realization of the uh, CHSA scenario. So you have the four measurements now just labeling label labeling the uh, edges in that way so you have a you have a uh, square uh, square which is a totally different topology than the punctured punctured torus but anyway so there are different ways of realizing uh, a scenario uh, so there are two basic lemmas uh, one of them is the extension lemma the other one is the gluing lemma uh, so the gluing uh, gluing lemma uh, allows you to show something is non-contextual by decomposing it into simpler pieces and showing each piece is non-contextual. So you have the tetrahedron on the right-hand side, and the big piece here is glued using these two, uh, gluing these two tetrahedrons, boundaries of the two tetrahedrons along a triangle. Uh, so by hand, you can just show that each tetrahedron is um, non-contextual. And the gluing lemma tells that since each piece is non-contextual, the large piece is non-contextual, and the extension lemma tells us that if you want to show something non-contextual on the CHSH, it suffices to extend it to this large piece and then show that the large piece is non-contextual. Well, we have already shown that the large piece is non-contextual. If you look at uh, the CHSH inequalities, they imply uh, that they allow you to uh, extend the distribution. So that's the proof of finds there. And I'm not sure if this is an uh, you know, improvement but it is a pictorial uh, different way. And so I think uh, funny to have the last names are fine and good, uh, fine and okay. So <laughs> I can't really compare which one's good, which one's better, so. <laughs> uh, but there's a, there's a bonus. If you go back to the uh, other realization, which is the punctured torus, you can say the following. Uh, a distribution on the CHSA scenario is non-contextual if and only if that distribution extends to a non-signaling uh, uh, extends to a distribution on the uh, on the full torus. Uh, so this is something uh, something new that comes out of uh, the topological uh, approach here, the simplicial approach here, which characterizes non-contextual CA as an extension to uh, this closed uh, surface. Um, if you have ever uh, come across that uh, scenario, I would like to uh, talk about. So <laughs> um, I find that uh, quite interesting, a torus uh, scenario. So this is something uh, as a bonus that comes out. Uh, well, in particular, if you look at the, uh, the vertex, the PR box, you can try to extend it and you will fail to match because 
uh, one plus zero is different than uh, zero plus zero. So that's, but you can also do it for any uh, distribution. These are very extreme and you just see it quite clearly that it doesn't match. Okay, so finally I can tell a bit uh, about the generality of the framework. If you look at the bottom part, that is uh, the description of a simplicial distribution. The framework decomposes it into two pieces, uh, the measurement space. You see there are only the labels for measurements. Uh, so this is a simplicial set, so you can think of it as a topological space, very general. Uh, and on the right hand side, I haven't described very much, uh, since I don't have the time, there's a space of outcomes, that's why. Uh, it's also very general. So the basic idea here is to extend the discrete labels of measurements and outcomes to spaces of measurements and spaces of outcomes, so that's quite general. Um, so that's the starting point. Um, and then you can construct uh, a distribution space. Again, it's a simplicial set, so everything happens in one framework, in one category. And now a simplicial distribution, which was this triangle and then probabilities inside, is essentially, mathematically, it's a simplicial set map between, uh, from the space to the uh, space of measurements to the distributions on the space of outcomes. And now you can do a quantum version if you just change properties with projectors. The pH over there is just the same object where you have uh, project, uh, projectors instead of uh, probabilities. That uh, we call a simplicial uh, projector measurement. And then you can look at uh, simplicial set maps from your space, and then you get simplicial uh, measurements. And then Born rule is functorial, uh, which means that if you choose a state and then take the trace, you get a simplicial distribution. So you can study, uh, you can pick a quantum state and then uh, pick your simplicial measurement and then study uh, quantum contextuality. So that's essentially how quantum contextuality arises in this framework. So uh, that's all, thanks. Okay, many thanks to uh, to Shiha for beautifully illustrated talk. Thank you for the talk. So we, we saw lots of triangles and you were building things out of triangles, but of course you can go to higher dimensions and you have tetrahedra yeah. or simplices, right? Mm -hmm. Is there a minimal dimension that is like, expressive in the sense of recovering all non-contextual models or is that, does that make sense even the, this question? Uh, so there is a, I mean, so this canonical realization that I mentioned at some point. Uh, yeah, so okay, so there's, so there was this thing here on the left hand side. Uh, so of course, given any non signaling distribution, you can um, construct a space as in the left hand side, where the dimensionality of the measurements is zero. And this is always uh, realizable also in our framework. So you can take the non-signaling distributions and embed it into our framework. But there's also another uh, embedding where you have uh, a dimension shift. There might be different embeddings, which I don't know. Uh, so that's what I can tell. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Have we any other questions? Yes. Um, <clears throat> sorry, do you get any nice pictorial sort of representations of the hierarchies of contextuality in your picture or? Ah, uh, okay. Um, yeah. Hierarchies of contextuality. Well, yeah, I mean, so in this one, uh, for example, so this is also realizable in our uh, framework. So this is a state independent contextuality. So this is a very strong type of contextuality. Uh, so you can study this version also in our framework and, you know, import the cohomological stuff. So there's a, you can do a cohomology theory um, and then capture contextuality. And there's a refinement uh, compared to this one. Instead of state independent one, you can characterize strong contextuality uh, using cohomology classes, uh, non-vanishing of cohomology classes. And I forgot to say, uh, you can also express Gleason's theorem and Cauchy's Specker's theorem within this formalism. Maybe I should go down here. Uh, one flexibility there, which is not exploited, is the y. Uh, so I haven't told you what y is. I always draw the picture of x 
So why in all the pictures in the triangles were uh, a space that comes from an algebraic topology called the nerve space or a classifying space of uh, Z mod two. You can take a circle as well uh, if you want to express quotient Specker and Gleason. So that's, I mean, the flexibility on the, on the outcome space is quite interesting uh, as well. But yeah, I mean, that's partially answering your uh, question and then adding this thing, yeah. Um, any other questions for Sheehan? Yeah, and dodge myself one then. But um, so in the comparison with the kind of uh, the sheaf approach, what you what you represent is the um, you represent the base space of the measurements. And so often in these pictures, we see the we represent the bundle space as well. It's like one of the yeah. kind of attractive things. So in your case, I kind of um, I gather that maybe it's your 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 attaching weights or something to the to the edges in your diagrams or or have I perhaps misunderstood? Yeah, no, I haven't thought actually. So you're asking, I guess, if you can represent bundle diagrams in this framework. Uh, I believe you can, but I haven't thought about it. Mm -hmm. So because you, so, so the outcomes uh, here, outcomes appear as a target space mm -hmm. instead of a space that maps down to the measurement. So, uh, but I mean, there's in algebraic topology, you can sometimes, you know, something in the target can be brought up as a fiber yes. bundle. So I haven't looked at that, mm. but the question yeah, makes, makes sense. So. Okay. All right, so perhaps we'll wrap up for that talk and thank Shihan. <laughs> Joined with uh, Michael, uh, Michael Zurel, Robert Rosendorf, and also Arne Heimendahl, uh, that was supposed to be the uh, people who contributed to the uh, original talk. Um, there is a polytope that was invented uh, or considered for a classical simulation of quantum computing uh, computation um, in this paper uh, for, for qubits. Uh, and the talk which Michael was supposed to give is, is, a, is a QDIT version of that uh, polytope for hot local dimensions. But I'm going to tell you the qubit version uh, anyways, because the slides that I have from a different talk uh, is, uh, might, might, might give you some ideas. So what is this polytope? Uh, so I have just a picture here, right here. So, so the polytope uh, here is a convex polytope, finitely many vertices. Uh, it's uh, for any uh, number of qubits, the polytope uh, in the in quest that, that I'm, I'm describing, it contains uh, the space of density operators. So uh, that's the formal definition. Uh, well, if you don't want to read the definition, there's a quick way of describing it. Uh, you take the stabilizer polytope and then take the polar dual, the stabilizer polytope. That's some polytope theoretic notion. Uh, or instead of requiring positivity with respect to all projectors, you just Require positivity with respect to stabilizer state, and you get a polytope that contains uh, density operators. So that's the picture for a single qubit. That's the eight-state model, uh, and just imagine the block sphere is sitting inside. So in, that means if you if you choose a quantum state, uh, then you can decompose it into a probabilistic mixture of the vertices. You can do it for any uh, number of uh, qubits. And then uh, the thing that we want to simulate classically is the uh, magic state model, where you start from the quantum state and you apply a sequence of Pauli measurements. And once you decompose the quantum state into the vertices, uh, all you need to do is to update the vertices uh, at each level, at each time, um, as you perform your uh, measurements. Um, and then the update rules uh, in the eight state model is depicted there. So you have with one over two probability, if you're sitting at the vertex, you will either stay there or go to another one that's indicated by the arrow. So that's the simulation uh, algorithm. Uh, but of course, you can do it for any uh, number of uh, qubits. And the crucial point here is that there is no negativity that appears in the simulation. Uh, so you might ask because negativity 
uh, quantifies uh, hardness, you might ask why the hardness, the hardness here is hiding. And that's, well, that's, that's an open question, so we don't know, uh, so I don't have the answer to. But uh, there are certain types of uh, vertices that are called CRC type vertices, um, um, for which we know the description uh, explicitly, and we know how to update. And these are efficient. So, so you can think of there's this large, huge polytope. Uh, maybe I should tell you a bit of numbers. So you have for one qubit, you have the eight state model, eight vertices. Uh, for two qubits, you have a very large polytope. It has, it's a polytope with 22,000-ish uh, vertices. So it's, it's very huge. Uh, and for three qubits, it gets to millions and very, very large. So um, these uh, type of vertices uh, that we call closed non-contextual uh, uh, vertices that are easy to describe and you can update them uh, efficiently. So that sub part of the polytope spanned by these vertices is efficiently uh, simulatable. So that means whenever, you're, uh, whenever your initial state is inside this polytope, uh, you can efficiently simulate. Uh, but in fact, uh, these are not the all. You can you can go beyond that. Uh, well, this is a different talk, so <laughs> I'm just going to tell uh, what whatever I have here, uh, and then probably end uh, soon. So um, you can actually. Uh, sorry, I couldn't find the vertex. Yeah. So there are other types of vertices uh, that you can uh, consider. So the CNC type vertices. Uh, that's a, that's the one over. There, the expectations are zero or plus minus one uh, in the Fowler basis. There are different vertices for this is a for two, two qubit case. There are different vertices for, for example, that one over there uh, also uh, assumes uh, expectations which are like uh, minus one over two plus one over two. So these are not, uh, this is not a CNC type. Uh, but it turns out that actually you can also describe this uh, efficiently, also update it efficiently, but the rules are much complicated. Uh, so uh, that means actually there are other vertices outside the C and C type vertices that are still uh, efficiently, you know, uh, updatable. So you can uh, ask the question how much we can extend this uh, polytope and quantify, you know, search for hardness where, where, where it arises uh, in this in this polytope. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> uh, sorry, so this is not the talk, of course, but Michael was going to tell you the QDIT version of this. You can do everything in the QDIT case and there are theorems there, so, so I don't have that talk, sorry. Okay, so th thanks a lot, Shihan, in the circumstances for a hastily, um, hastily put together a presentation. Um, so I, I'll ask just in case anyone has burning questions on that paper. So the paper was the hidden variable model for quantum computation with magic states on any number of qubits, uh, qubits, sorry, of any dimension. Um, in case anyone wanted to, yeah. So what, um, what kind of computations fall inside the CNC or the other efficiently updatable oh, polytopes? See. Is that, I mean, is that easy to identify or? Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. Okay. Which computations for, you know, particular algorithms that. Well, I mean, so it sounds like what's nice about this is that you can express magic states. Uh -huh. as well, I mean, yeah, I mean. So can, you, can you write down some examples of circuits or systems that, where it's, there's a natural interpretation? Uh huh. Well, I mean, if you. Well, I don't have any examples in mind to tell, but I mean, this extend the, uh, you know, if you start from a stabilizer state, the simulation is going to be efficient. This is going to be extending that because the CNC part is going to be containing the stabilizer state. So, yeah. Okay, then another question. So how many vertices are there for a single QDIT? Ah, for, for a single QDIT, I don't know the number top okay. of my head. Uh, I mean, presumably it will change for the QDIT size. Sorry? 
presumably it will change for the cutest size. So two will be eight vertices and then. Yeah, for, 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 I think, yeah, I shouldn't say anything. I mean, probably Michael would say, okay. Uh, give you the correct numbers. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember that. Right. Okay. Yeah. I was just interested but you can, how you can it would scale. With, you can definitely yeah. describe the polytope for, for a single cutest. Yeah. Right. Okay, cool. And how, sorry, how are these vertices? How do you determine how many vertices there are? Oh, how do you determine that? Yeah. Uh, using computer. Oh, so you try to enumerate right. them. Yeah. Uh, so the goal is to enumerate them in a, in a, in a kind of closed form, right? Mm -hmm. And the, in the CNC type, the enumeration is quite easy because you use collection of isotropic subspaces and you have generators, which doesn't really scale exponentially. So you can describe them uh, easily. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. In that case. Um, all right. Well, um, I guess at that point we can we can wrap up the session. Um, so say thanks to the speakers, to Mate and to and to Xi'an for the for the two talks. <laughs>